Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the East Ham Senior Center, and welcome to our first program in our series of Collecting Memories. I'd like to introduce Marka Daly from the East Ham Historical Society. Thank you so very much. Um, someone in the audience just said, I said, this is the first time we've done this or tried this, and she said, so we're your guinea pigs? And I rather feel like I'm your guinea pig for trying to attempt this. Um, I want to introduce myself, Marka Daly, and I was born and raised in East Ham, spent many years abroad, and came back to East Ham 10 years ago. My grandmother and grandfather were Verena and Ray Daly, and you might know the Swift Daly House, which is one of the museums that the Historical Society runs, along with the old Tool Museum, which was my grandpa's tool shop, and the Dill Beach Camp. So I spent most of my childhood summers running over to Grammy's house and on rainy days playing inside that house and just wonderful memories and helping out in the garden. And when I came back 10 years ago, my aunt, Dorcas Gill, uh, helped out at the Swift Daily House as a guide because she grew up in the house and I liked to hang out with her, so I did and became a guide. And from there it was a short, short stepped down the road to the old schoolhouse museum where I became a guide. <laughs> and then I started working with Bobby Cornish, who was the archivist. And when Bobby retired a few years later, I kind of naturally continued on doing the archivist work. And currently I'm also the curator of the schoolhouse museum. <laughs> So I spend a lot of time in the old schoolhouse where my mom went to school and lots of my family members and lots of your parents too. And so when Dorothy reached out last summer to ask if we might collaborate on some kind of project with the Council on Aging and the Historical Society, I thought that sounds neat, you know. <laughs> So we got together and started brainstorming. And I have to say, this is Dorothy's idea, but I love it. And so we thought we would try to make interactive conversations, part presentation, part audience participation on East Ham's history. And she thought we should start with the old Sam Brackett's General Store, which is now the Friends of the East Ham Council on Aging thrift shop. How many of you are involved with the thrift shop or have been there? Yes. <laughs> I must admit that I had not been there in a long, long time. So I'm counting on your memories um, when we get beyond the 1800s <laughs> and, and bracket store, because I'm really good with archival history and photos. <laughs> but I need you guys for the more modern um, mid-1900s, let's say. So I need to thank Dorothy. I need to thank Bobby Cornish. I need to thank Al Mills who works with me in the archives, and I need to thank Mary Jane Eckel for allowing me into the thrift shop one day so that I could take lots of photos and um, pick her brains. I need to thank you for coming and allowing me to collect your memories. And the pieces of paper, the colored note cards on the chairs are if any of the photos in here um, evoke a memory, write it down. Just jot it down. And, at the, and I'd love it if you would put your names on these um, because I want to collect your memories. We'll be asking you to share them 
but just a kind of a shorthand in note form on the cards so I can include them in this PowerPoint presentation um, and update it because it will be far richer than anything that I can give to you, which is from the books and files. This, this will be coming from you and from your hearts and from your experience. So if today is successful, I want to ask you what other topics or historical sites or something to do with East Ham you would like to discuss at further presentations. I believe they're going to be the last Thursdays of every month, excluding October, but in November and in December and going forward, if it works out. So if you have any ideas, we have one. We were thinking of um, somebody recalled the blizzard, hurricane blizzard of 78, when all of the um, outer beach camps disappeared except for the Dill Beach Camp, which is now one of our museums. And then I recalled Hurricane Bob of 1991. And Debbie, we had a conversation about that a while ago. And I thought, whoa. And then I've come across many aerial shots in the archives of erosion at the beaches and what they used to be like and what they're like now. And I thought, well, that might be a neat topic to look at memories of what we went through during some really strong Mother Nature <laughs> um, events. OK, that's a long-winded introduction. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to take this chronologically. So I'm going to give a little background on East Tam the historical background and context of Northeast Tam, which is Massasoit Road, which was also known as West Main Street. It was the main street from through East Tam to Wellfleet back in the day. I'll give you a short history, a timeline of the store itself, the building. Many, many discrepancies in dates, in deeds, and who bought what from whom. <laughs> And Sam Brackett's timeline, because he is the one, Samuel F. Brackett, who's most often associated with this store. Then we'll move to memories of Brackett's, the store itself, with some voices from the past. I've um, loaded the audience with their voices. <laughs> and people were very willing, thank you, thank you, thank you, to act the part of these voices, which I found in our archives in the old interviews that we did in the 80s of East Ham residents and what it was like growing up here in East Ham in the early days. We'll have voices from the present and memories of not only the store, but the Brackett Farm and photos, quite a few photos of then and now, including relics of the past. Um, and then we'll move on to the Mitten Factory. Its real name, I guess, was Cape Cod Oven Mitts Manufacturers. Um, I do not know much of that history, so I hope some of you do. Is Barbara here? Ah, OK. So I know we have at least one really neat memory here. Um, and we have some relics from the basement of the store of the thrift shop that we rescued over the summer. Um, and now we have them at the Randlett Tool Museum. And then the Friends of the East Ham Council on Aging thrift shop. And you, I'm counting on you for all of these memories. And the thrift shop has been there since 1984. So by my count, you're heading into your 40th year. Yes, that's amazing. So here is a postcard from the Society of the Store, Samuel F. Brackett. And that's at the turn of the century. Um, and we know it's the turn of the century because I did some 
research on the buggies and the buggy wheels and what was <laughs> when they had the particular buggy wheels. <laughs> I did the same thing for an old photo of Swift Daily House because we didn't know how to date it. Um, but then I figured out you could use fashion magazines. The gentleman was wearing a hat, the buggy and the horse and you know, so it's really fun working in the archives. Here is Brackett House and Store. They're on opposite sides of West Main Street, Massasoit. So here, can you see that little arrow? Okay, that's the store. It's only half the length of what it used to be. Um, and this is the old Brackett House, which is no longer there. And that's why you have quite a nice merging of Herringbrook Road, Massasoit Road, Campground Road, because it used to block the way. Are you interested in questions that come up? Or yes, and or write them down. Either way is fine with me. Okay. I just thought that what became the Siemens Bank was always called the Bracket House. That's the Bracket Farm. It'll come up and you'll see it. It's, it's very different. It was on the other side of Massasoit Road, further towards East um, Route, what's now Route 6. Yes. So here's another view of Massasoit Road. <laughs> Before they put down the oil and cinders, uh, it was rough going to get to Wellfleet. <laughs> And I know this one is a little bit later because the trees are a little bit taller. <laughs> but that's all I know. Electricity came to Massasoit Road in 1936. Before that, Art Nick said he was Abe Lincoln and did his homework by candle or kerosene lamp. And we have the telephone poles. Um, I just found out Tuesday in the archives, uh, someone asked about electricity coming, when did it come to East Ham? And Provincetown had electricity long before East Ham did, at least 10 years. And then it worked its way up to Truro, and then it came in this direction, so we didn't get it until the 30s. But I still haven't determined when. Um, does anyone want to know how I know that? Town records. They, they, the first mention of light in the town hall as an expense was in 1930 something, two, I think. <laughs> you have to be a detective. So here's the store then and now. And the, mm, on the left hand side, that's an old postcard from the archives. And on the right hand side, I took this last week. And I went across, um, I was at the intersection scooching down so I could get those flowers, you know, in front of the store, but it was just so pretty. It was a beautiful day. That's when Mary Jane let me go. So here's a history of the store, and I'm using the Historic Properties Survey which have been done for East Ham on buildings older than 75 years from, nine, from 1995. I'll tell you right off, the documentation for 1995 is iffy. 2005, 2013, and 2020. So I used the survey of 2020 because it seemed the most reliable and the one that had the most sources in bibliography. And I have that at the end in case anyone's interested. But what they said about this property, which is now known as 580 Massasoit Road, how many of you remember when we did not have house numbers? <laughs> Practically all of us. <laughs> and even the, um, the original East Ham Vacationers handbooks, it, they would say cottage colony on the bay. <laughs> and, the, and the telephone was Orleans 852. <laughs> you know, it was. Anyway, 
The property at 580 Massasoit Road is significant on a local level with regard to the criteria from this Mass Historical Commission um, to be considered a building of historic um, significance um, as a remarkably intact 19th century commercial building and as the sole surviving historic commercial building in East Ham. And I thought, wow, and it still is a commercial building surviving in East Ham, the oldest. So, the house you can, the building you could read was built in 1871. Some people, some documentation say it was built in 1879. I've also seen the date 1874. Um, so you don't really know, but then you play detective and find out who sold it to who, how old they were. You know, if it was uh, built, someone said that it was sold to some document um, bracket in 18, like 78, uh, when he would have been 12 years old or something like that, so no. <laughs> So I've gone with what I can best determine from all of the documentation that we have. There was a store here. It was founded by a man who had a packet boat, and I think it was the Mary May, Queen May. Anyway, he wanted to sail that packet boat up and down Cape Cod Bay from the different towns. That was the preferred mode of travel. Um, but goods landed at Campground Landing. That's why it has its name. There were lots of little landings along the bay. And they were carted to the store. The same as packet boats would land people there for the camp meetings and cart them to Millennial Grove, where they stayed in tents for the Methodist camp meetings that thro thrived or throve? No. Thrived um, in the mid 1800s before they moved to Yarmouth. But what we do know is that the property was sold by Harding Cobb to a John Bangs in, in 1855. It probably did not have this building on it, it was a very large parcel of land. But there was a store there from the mid 1800s. Bangs sold the property to Joseph Holbrook, who was an oyster man, sound familiar? <laughs> in 1873, and he in turn sold it to Arthur H. Cobb, not Arthur C. Cobb, <laughs> in 1874. And these are from the Barnstable County of Deeds. By 1890, Sam Brackett, F worked for Cobb, and Cobb had moved off Cape to Braintree. And he was going to stay off Cape, but it looked like Samuel Brackett was kind of managing the store for him. And in 1903, he bought the store from Cobb. Um, I can't verify that it was $1,700, but that's what's published in this report. Um, and Sam and his brother George ran the store. Uh, George's name doesn't appear on any of the deeds, only Sam's. But George is the one who continued at the store once Sam had left it and gone back to farming. And in 1929, he turned the management of the store over to his son Samuel, but he maintained it, he's still the one on the deed. So the timeline for Sam Brackett is he was born December 28, 1864. And what I love, these are all from the US Census records, which I found, and the Massachusetts Census records and East Ham's vital records. Um, at five years old, he was at home. 
because he wasn't going to school, and so that's how students who didn't go to school, they just, in the census records, it's at home. At 15, he was a farm laborer. When he married at 23, he was a trader, and he married Anna Eldridge, known as Annie, from Wellfleet. Um, 1900, he was a grocer. They had been married 11 years and had had two children, but both of them had died in those years. 1920, they'd been married, no, sorry, 10. He was a merchant. I love how the terms change um, on the census records. And he, they did have a son who lived, Samuel. Uh, then, 1920, storekeeper. 1930, farmer. But he still owned the store, but George ran the store. Um, 1932, Annie passed away. 1940, he was a widower at home again. And in 1948, he died on June 7th. I, what I like is the kind of the symmetry. He began at home, he went into farming, he became a trader, grocer, merchant, storekeeper, back to farming and back to home again. Um, it just, it's poetic. I'm an English teacher. <laughs> So memories of the store. This is where I have to get my script out. Um, so does anyone in here remember Bell Brackett? Yes. yes. Town clerk for how many years? Uh, Organist at the Methodist Church for how many years? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful lady. Um, and we have one of her memories. So, Belle, your husband's name was Sam? Yes, Samuel Brackett. Can you tell us something about him and his family? Oh, yes. His father, Samuel F. Brackett, owned the general store down here at Northeastham. He ran it with his, his half-brother, George Brackett. Well, that was just the place for people here in East Ham to buy everything. The store was a general store, and you could buy anything from a stick of gum to a ton of hay, or coal, or gallons of oil, just everything. I have a picture here showing George Wiley, who worked for them with the delivery wagon and the horse. And he just went all over town taking orders for Everything, everything. Somebody said they had a delivery system. I think it was Joe King. Joe? Yes, they did. George Wiley used to go down and take the orders today and make the delivery tomorrow. They had a horse and a wagon. It was one of those old covered wagons, a covered wagon, you know, like a big butcher cart enclosed. And a majority of the people around here paid their bill twice a year after the crops came in. They even bought all their fertilizer off of Bracket there. Used to come down by the car load, right Art? The fertilizer would be on the honor system. You'd go up there, you'd order five tons of fertilizer or one ton of fertilizer. It came in hundred pound bags then. I'd hate to try to lift one now. Those uh, we used to throw around like nothing. But you ordered from Mr. Brackett, Samuel F. Brackett and Son. You ordered your fertilizer. It would come by freight car over by Roach's plant, where the depot was. It was the honor system. If you had two tons of fertilizer come, that would be 40 bags. You go over there, and you'd get 40 bags yourself. You wouldn't ask Brackett or anything else. The word would get around that the fertilizer would be in. So you'd go over there and help yourself to 40 bags, if that's what you had ordered. When I was 12 years old, I ordered a ton myself from Brackett and got trusted for it, 12 years old. I love that. Unfortunately, thankful for us, Mary Ann has a great voice. Art Nick's voice on the tape was so a little bit gnarled that we couldn't understand it. So, so Mary Ann, thankful. Um, 
Do you have any memories of what was sold in the store? Well, you could go up and get yourself a new pair of bloomers. <laughs> you could go up and get your stockings, dresses, men's shoes, men's pants, shirts, jugs of molasses in a barrel down in the basement there. You used your own jug, and they had a spigot on there to fill it. Our Benner remembers the molasses too. And in a 1988 interview, he said, downstairs from there was a molasses barrel where the molasses was kept. Someone left the spigot open one day and the barrel of molasses went all over the floor and we always smelled that nice aroma afterwards. <laughs> And these are the stairs. This past June when I was there and we, empty, we pulled some things out that hadn't seen the light of day since the days we're talking about, these are the stairs that lead up to the store. Did it still smell? No. <laughs> if you got through the spider webs, you know, the cobwebs, maybe. Um, uh, this, Picture this, you might want to close your eyes. I don't have photos, but this is Art Benner in 1988, um, recalling in detail the interior of the store. As you came in the entrance door, on your left was the big candy counter, which was the number one object. And then on the north wall, all the patent medicines. And as you proceeded in, there was a big coffee grinder and a hand of bananas. If you went still further to go out the back part, there were the buggy whips, which hung in a little circular affair, and also the sugar and flour barrels. On the south side of the store was a little cubicle where the bookkeeping was done. And also on the south side was another showcase with odds and ends and big counter with dry goods and yard goods all shapes, sizes, colors, and dimensions, and so forth on rolls. Of course, people did more of their own millinery work in those days, and I remember there was a big iron safe where the bookkeeping was done, I suppose to keep their money and stuff. Then there was a sort of separation, almost a petition, between the two sides. Beyond the petition, there was a big wooden box that had rubber boots, one of the necessities of the day. <laughs> Consider those roads. <laughs> there were slickers, rain gear, all that sort of thing. A staircase led upstairs, just before you went out to the back part of the store. Up there, they had dishware and such things, odds and ends. And if you went out to the next part of the building, you'd be into where they did their deliveries, unloaded the eggs and the grain and where George Wiley's delivery wagon was. There was a big, big ice chest out there where the soda pop and the salt pork and the meat was kept. And the next section out was where the grain and the coal and the hardware and so forth was kept. Beyond that was a sort of enclosure where all the cartons and debris was kept. And then was the small one-car garage. Beyond that was the barn with its attached sheds. And in the barn was a nice buggy, a rubber-tired buggy, and an old REO truck they had scrapped. The horse was kept off to one side of that, and another shed was just near the road from that. I think the truck on your shirt might be an old REO truck. Do you have any idea? No. That's what they look like. They're those flat fronted trucks um, that you used to see all around. And, and when I saw that, I said, ooh, I'm going to be talking about that. <laughs> anyway. Finally, um, and now we'll get to your voices, but I have a one other question for Belle Brackett. 
What happened to the store? How long did it operate? And when it did it stop? Well, I think we weathered the depression in the store. It was a very profitable business. But then that was about the time when the chain store came into Orleans. And my father-in-law, well, people in those days depended on their asparagus and turnip crop and shellfishing for their livelihood. They would place their order for fertilizer with my father-in-law in the fall for their turnips and asparagus. When the fertilizer came, they would say, now when we sell our crop, we'll be back to pay the bill. And if the crop didn't sell, mm -hmm. the bill was not paid. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little on account, he used to carry people. They used to call it that. I'll carry him through the winter with groceries and all of that. And when the spring came and they could begin to get an income from the fishing or the asparagus, then they would pay the bill. And of course, that was the old way of doing business. But when the chain stores came and the people could buy much cheaper, they would forget that they owed the grocery bill from last year. And there are people in this town today that when my family went out of business, they were unable to pay the bill. Any other memories have these voices from the past evoked in yourselves, perhaps? I just love hearing those. Thank you so much. So the interview with Bell was in the 80s? Yes. OK. And Deb seemed to think she was in her 80s at the time that I can yeah, yeah, I think she was a little older than my dad because okay. he treated her like an elder. <laughs> and, and that would put her yeah. into her 80s in the 80s. Right. Yeah. How far did the original store go back? Yeah. Twice as far as it is, as long as it is now. Including the barn and everything? No, the barn was beyond it. <laughs> it was a huge, it was a 1.97 acre parcel of land. So I don't think it's quite as hemmed in as it is now. Well, we have, there are a couple of memories, connections, that I came across and they were really quite interesting. In 1967, this is the intersection of the road with the Brackett House you can't see it, be, well, you can hardly see it because it's been burned twice. It burned down once, huge fire, uh, and then as they were rebuilding it, it burned again. And they offered the house and the land to the town of East Ham for $5,000. And it came up at a special town meeting. And in the small print here, there were people who said that it wasn't the place to come up at a special town meeting. It had to wait for the real town meeting <laughs> in May. <laughs> and someone else said, well, why are they selling it to us for 5,000? I heard that two other people offered 4,500. So someone else made a motion that they accepted for 4,500, but they put it off until the next town meeting and by then they didn't get it. <laughs> a little bit of politics. Howard Quinn has a 10 book um, set scrapbooks of everything that happened in East Ham back in the day. <laughs> and he's one of my go-tos for trying to find things out. Uh, it's really interesting. This, is very interesting. This is a painting by Edward Hopper, um, who did many paintings of East Ham homes. A special Chapel in the Pines is one of his most well-known. It's a watercolor. I received this as a request to the archives to see if I could, now imagine, this comes in an email and said, could you please identify where this is? I've heard it's in East Ham. 
So I took a look and I asked Al to take a look. <laughs> and, and we were trying to think of intersections that it might be. And then I had a brainstorm and I wrote back to the woman who was an art um, gallery owner and said, why don't you try contacting Bob C? <laughs> who could very well know where this is. He's an expert on Hopper and East Ham. And the next time I saw Bob, I said, did you get an email from so-and-so? Oh yes, that's the corner of Massasoit Road and Herringbrook. <laughs> so, and you can tell, you know, when you see it, it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> it must be. Um, so here's the Brackett Farm. Now, I think, no, I didn't. This is on the highway. This is Route 6. It's two photos. These are from Jim Owen's collection. Uh, he put together a, hundreds of photos of old, spelled with an E, East Ham. Um, and so here is part of the farm, and here's the other part with the stained glass windows in, right up in the center over the doorway. And when Siemens Bank bought that property, people were very concerned. And there it is. <laughs> but they stayed with um, the essence of the style. So who had that memory? Yeah. My dad was the chairman of the Historical Commission when um, Siemens Bank bought the property. And they were, I remember him talking about the fact they were fabulous to work with because they loved the general design of the building that was there. Mm -hmm. They had no interest in just throwing up some typical bank building, bank looking building. Um, so they not only restored and kept the stained glass. Anybody who's ever been in the bank can see. You can go in and visit. There's a lot of the woodwork that they saved mm -hmm. and the stained glass windows. Um, and when you go into the bank, you can see there's a, like there's a, and, and you see the tower and stuff like that. Yes. It was, you know, similar, kind of like architecturally similar to what was in Bracket Farm itself. I mean, they were just, they wanted to do the farm justice. And right. I think they did. There are some fabulous photographs going upstairs along that wall. Just beautiful when I did a presentation on turnips. <laughs> They've got lots of photos and, and that's where I got some of them. Other? We'll move on. Oh, relics of the past. This is from Sam Brackett's store, and it is still in Sam Brackett's store. It's the large countertop um, in the thrift shop. And it will look very familiar. Down in the basement, there is another 12-foot long um, countertop just like this. Uh, we couldn't get it out. <laughs> but we did get a little one out, and the guys from the tool museum refurbished and made it relevant again. So it's no longer a relic from the past, but it's in the lobby, the entryway of the 1869 schoolhouse. And I just love it. We did not measure. We, they fixed it up at the tool museum. They brought it down. We had a typical manufactured desk that we used to do work at. And I thought, what are we gonna do with this desk? It's huge. I measured it six feet. I said to Mark Herman, how long is this thing? He says, oh, about six feet. I said, can it be a little bit longer? Um, we put the cabinet over the desk and there's room for the top of my index finger <laughs> in between. It's perf. It's like it was made to be there. And so I really love that. But there are other relics that we cannot use. Uh, there were pulleys <laughs> sitting on the back of, down in that basement. There were little hand 
carts, uh, two of them, as a matter of fact, different sizes. And the pulley, again, heavy as anything. Um, scales uh, that were in the store. And in the middle, this is an arrangement of hooks and chains that George Wiley, who we call Uncle George uh, Wiley, put on his cow's legs to keep the cow from kicking him when he milked it. <laughs> Ingenuity. Uncle George also had a blind horse that he used to give us rides on. <laughs> and the horse was always swatting flies off of itself. That's my memory. <laughs> there were lots of pulleys. This little blue arrow here, that's a pulley from Sam Brackett's store. And this one is also from Sam Brackett's store. But if you've never been in the Ranlett Tool Museum, we really should take a field trip there. Um, it's fabulous. It, it's just wonderful. And people are donating things to us all the time. And the guys from the Historical Society just do a wonderful jo job of cleaning them up and fixing them up and displaying them. Here's Mark Herman uh, with one of two hand carts that came from the basement of Brackett's store. The second hand cart, there are two of them are end to end on mm, that side, left hand side. And the boxes on top I will save for the mitten factory. So that's my segue into the mitten, mitten factory. Um, Sam Brackett closed the store in 1933 but he did not sell it, he kept it. It just was closed. And in 1944, George Morse and his wife, Mary Morse, sometimes known as Marie, um, he was an interior decorator in Plimpton, Mass. She made artificial flowers and things for homes. He boarded at her house. Two years later, they were married and bought, opened the mitten factory to make oven mitt slippers and other quilted goods. Does anyone here remember that mitten factory? Yay! Tell us. Oh, I remember the monkey. <laughs> the monkey! <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I mean, I sat here and I'm like, now I have to ask about the monkey was in there. Oh, maybe I shouldn't ask because it's probably ridiculous. Uh -huh. and I the second bullet point and I'm like, oh my God. The monkey, yeah. there. the monkey is was there, but they spelled. I'm sorry to whoever made this sign. It's C C O, not C K O. <laughs> Rocco, over in this photo. Now, do you recognize this young woman? There she is, Barbara. Tell us your memories. I guess I would be ten, maybe eight, nine, ten, and my sister was next to me. Yes, yeah, she's almost out of the frame. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but she is. She's she's right here. You can yeah, see yeah. a little so bit I'm younger. I'm guessing I'm close to ten, and she's two years younger than me. So, uh, but uh, my parents used to go to the mitten store every year. Well, my mother did every year because um, everybody in the family got mitts, or they made slippers. Also. Yes. They made, um, Quilts and slippers. And I don't remember anything else that they made, but that's what my mother did her Christmas shopping. <laughs> so, you know, kids don't want to go Christmas shopping, so, you know, Rocco was outside the back door. And, and here's Rocco with his hand out the cage. Yeah. So we used to visit Rocco, and then occasionally my dad would stop, you know, and just let us get out and go see Rocco. Right. You know, being little kids and stuff. But the photo and, says it's. You no, know, he was in the cage. He's it's always in the cage. July of 58. Oh, with 58. Okay, so I am 10. Yep. Yep. And here's Ryan. Oh, here's his <laughs> little face, and his mouth is wide open. I think you must have treats for him. Yes, I don't know if they had peanuts there for us to give him, or whether we brought something. <laughs> he was pretty good about picking, picking <laughs> food. So that was kind of where Ryan is. Wow. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah. Here, here is some of the. Yeah. Um, this is the sign that they had Cape Cod oven mitts manufacturers. And down below, here's one of the mitts. 
and a pair of slippers. They look like they had um, like a firm yeah, sole on yeah, them. Well, in 1956, they were sued by the Boston Quilting Company. Oh. Um, they continued operating the store uh, for a while, um, but. He, these are the relics that we found. This is, we found two of these shelves and sets of shelves, and that's where they kept their forms, the patterns to make. Um, this would have been, I think, a, some kind of a pot holder over here. Here's a slipper. Here's a square pot holder on this side. And two racks of those. They're a little the worse for wear. But <laughs> they're in the tool museum. Yes. And and they're gonna try and fix them up and, and the ones that are bent, you know, reshape them to what they would have been like. I don't yes. were these were these things stitched on the premises? Was the factory? Yes, it was a factory, yes. Because it was a huge building. The front would have been the showcase, but it, they would have done the work in the back part. When, when did it um, be chopped apart? When, when was it um, the back part of it taken off? Or? Don't know. Nobody remembers that. I, I didn't even look it up. I saw um, that was Art Benner who said that um, in his interview, that it's half of what it used to be, but I hadn't seen anything about you were down in there for the foundation, mm. the foundation underneath that whole building. You think that the back part was an add-on? It was just for storage? And the uh, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. No. But what did I say here? So I don't know when they closed. Um, I have no idea. So the factory? The factory? Yeah. Closed, you said it closed in 71. No, well, I said it eventually closed, but from 71, it was, they were sued. And so, but she kept, the, the wife kept everything in her, it was in her trust. They had both passed away, but it was in her estate trust. And that's when it went oh, to I the see. Delaney's. So I'm not sure when they okay. closed. I only remember it as an elementary school. Um, I don't remember it in high school. So I went up to the high school in 62. So do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah late, late 50s maybe. So again, there was a period of time when there wasn't anything there. Well, it was still open during the suit then, because my sister's 58. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, huh. <laughs> right. Well, we'll move from there to the thrift shop because the Delaney's ran an antique store, I believe. And I don't know for how long they did that. I know in 18, 1984, some newspaper accounts say they donated the f space to the thrift shop. Others say they leased it to the thrift shop, um, which was almost a donation because they didn't charge very much rent at all. But I don't have any details of that. And it, the thrift shop opened in December of 84. And in the um, Historical Commission's report, it says that the first year they earned $17,000 oh, towards wow. the cost of building a new council on aging, which I assume is this building. Yeah. Wow. Um, so whose name is the DV in now? The town. Just became. Um, yeah, the 
Delaney sold it to the, it was always in their name and they recently, the town sold it to the town. So here, I don't remember when it was read. I do remember when it was read, but I don't know the years. And then this was last week again, the then and now. Um, In 2021, there was a story in the P-Town Independent. I like, you're in luck with a buck. <laughs> and this is the interior of the thrift store now, uh, what it looks like now also. And it kind of reminds me of what it must have looked like in Sam Brackett's day. I mean, I think that has come almost full circle also, which is really kind of neat. Well, and some of the counters are in the historical society. They're the ones we move all the time for our presentations. Yes, they came from Sam Brackett's store also. Um, thrift shop, talk to me, because I don't have any memories. What do you love about the thrift shop? I do have some interior, maybe this will jog your memory. Um, you have paintings yeah. of the building in the building. Yeah. Uh, this is Hopper again. <laughs> and the red one I don't know and I think there may be a signature uh, kind of right down here, but I cannot. Oh my God. It's 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 in the thrift store if at, yeah. shop. If anyone wants to take yeah, a look, it's it's it's, 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 it's beautiful. It's really lovely, and then you have lovely visual memories in there. These are some um, collages of bulletin boards of. Well, you tell me who it, what, who's it of? What's it? What's? Joanne and I have been there for I've been there fourteen years. She's been there 10, 10, 10, 10 12, something. Wow. Um, I'm president of the friend. She's vice president. I'm, I'm, we're we're on our way out. Is that your pic? <laughs> is that your picture in the news article? Yes. It's I right. thought it was you. But we haven't found anyone to step up and um, Whoop. take the job, so we're so in and out. Make your plea. <laughs> Captive audience. <laughs> but it's a fun place. It's wonderful to work there. We, our donations are what keep us going. The, it's such a community-based uh, shop because everybody realizes the money's going back to the Council on Aging yes. to support all the seniors. So we get fantastic donations and we have fantastic volunteers that are so good and so faithful. And it's very popular, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Hugely popular. Yeah. 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 Well, people come, come each year as they're on vacation. Yeah, we stop you know, and they say, Oh, we always had a common here. Right. I see a lot of out-of-state license plates. Right. <laughs> In the old parking area where they used to have all of the grain and fertilizer. <laughs> yes, Mary. I, I have a memory. It's not, it's not um, of the history of the store, but it's my history. I stop frequently there because I pass the, uh, the store. And... Uh, I think it was early in one season, you know, before all the crazies come up here. Um, <laughs> I, was, I, I found, and this is going back a few years now, uh, my granddaughter was in, I think, junior high, and she was learning to speak German, and I went, you know, you know you'll find anything in that shop. I went in and I found a, a travelogue um, uh, about Germany, ah. and I said, oh, she'll have fun with this, you know, she'll, she'll be able to see what Germany looks like, you know. She's living out in New York, out near Buffalo, out in the boonies, and I said, oh, this would be fun. So anyway, I go in there, and the woman was checking me out, sort of giggled when she saw what I was buying, and I tried to tell her that, you know, our background is German, and um, the last name is Schaefer, and from the back of the store, somebody yells, 
I know somebody named Schaefer. Where are you from? And I said, oh, New York State. You know, so, and she said, oh, I, well, I knew Schaefer's out in uh, um, um, Schaharie County. And I said, oh, I went to school in Schaharie County. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was uh, Alberta George was my oh. teacher. Oh, my God. <laughs> and she remembered me. Oh, <laughs> My wonderful memory of oh, Dragon wow. Storm. The only <laughs> teacher I hadn't seen in 50 years. Wow. Oh, she still works. She I know. I, I, try, I haven't seen her this season yet. I just asked. She only works on Saturdays. But that was a wonderful experience. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, well, this is the store today. The thrift store has replaced the Samuel F. Brackett sign on the side but not much different at all. And these are the sources that I used. Um, in the archives, we have vital statistics, and as I said, census records, oral history projects, postcards and photo collections, scrapbook collections, which have all the newspapers and everything and old books that people had written in memories and the old histories, and the 2020 Historical Commission, the sources that they used. And I just want to say heartfelt thanks to all of you who came today and allowed me to collect your memories. And I just thank you very, very much on behalf of the Historical Society and the Council on Aging.